we begin our event now, I'll introduce uh, each of our speakers uh, very briefly. Uh, we have uh, Ramesh Nair. Ramesh Nair is a good friend of ours, our family friend for 20 years, and he's from Chicago. He's flown all the way for this event, and I th want to thank him for that. Uh, he is CEO and founder of Vistara, an architectural and construction management firm. Their firm deals with civic architecture, such as schools, hospitals, courthouses, airports, post offices, you name it. He has worked uh, on the Chicago Air O'Hare Airport. You know, how many of us always make that connection? So he's worked on that for s uh, on several occasions. And he's most recently been working on, with Skidmore uh, on the upcoming Obama Library in Illinois. So these are the uh, glamorous projects, but he has, he's a very successful, shrewd businessman. And uh, Sanjay Dalal actually asked me, why are you bringing somebody from out of town? So I'm like, hello, federal contracts. <laughs> and uh, also, he's, uh, like I said, he's a very, uh, shrewd and tough businessman, uh, done very well for himself. And uh, when during his heydays, uh, he actually used to look like Prem Chopra. <laughs> so, and he would, Ramesh would say, uh, hu Prem, Prem Chopra. Oh, so, okay, and then uh, we have um, uh, Venu, uh, Venu Saraki. He's a very popular businessman in Orange County and uh, well respected in our Desi parties. Uh, so when I met him at a Desi party, I said, uh, hey, what did you do? And he said he didn't want to, but somehow he stumbled upon federal contracts and now they are his bread and butter. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of SAI. Uh, they are a multi multiple dis multidisciplinary engineering firm. Uh, federal contracts, like I said, are his bread and butter. And he's considered an, as an expert in this industry of uh, small business federal contracts uh, to the point where he was invited to the White House uh, on the advisory board to advise oh, President Obama. And that's his main golden ticket to coming here and being part of us to share that experience. And uh, those of you who attended the banking event, you must have seen there was Bridge Patel, and Bridge Patel does bridge financing. And uh, if you know, uh, most people who has, whose names are Dennis, they land up becoming dentists. And then we have uh, Pat Watts, who is, uh, whose firm actually works on uh, energy projects uh, with several utilities. Uh, she, they manage all, most of the uh, energy installs uh, for SDG&E, SCE, LADWP, uh, you name it. Again, you name it. Um, and uh, they have touched over, they've worked with over 150,000 customers in the last 10 years. Now I've known uh, Patricia, for, Pat, for a long, quite, a, quite some time. We work together on solar projects. Uh, she is a networking queen. So I'm happy that she's here and she can share with us how she grew her business uh, in a very uh, amazing fashion. And she's an, a very analytical and uh, excellent businesswoman. So we want to learn from you today. Okay, with that, I give you uh, Ramesh Nair. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Harina, for that most generous uh, introduction to my company and myself. Um, the main reason I came down to Orange County to talk about federal contracting is unlike local and state contracting, federal contracting is nationwide and actually it's international. You could actually end up working with the State Department building embassies overseas. The federal government touches almost every aspect of our lives. It depends on who you talk to. If you talk to a Democrat, he'll say they're spending too little money. If you talk to a Republican, he's going to say they spent too much money. So the happy medium is the fact that we are working with them, and I want to share some of that process with you today. The important thing to realize is when I started my company in 1994, um, I thought I was fully qualified to work with the federal government. You know, I was an architect. I was licensed. I had done large-scale projects internationally. I'd worked in London. I'd worked in Chicago. But, and I went and knocked at the federal door, if you want to call it, the doorway, if you want to say. And I was immediately showered with paperwork that sounded like bureaucracy. There were all these acronyms that were sent at me. Are you an IDIQ contractor? Do you know, are you an 8A? Are you CCR registered? Are you on SAM? I had no idea what they were talking about. So as I mentioned, I went up to the federal agency in charge of construction and architecture, and I 
they gave me all these acronyms, and that's what I thought it was. I thought IDIQ stood for indefinite delays in quotations. You know, 8A sounded like a class, you know. Hey, maybe I have to take a class, you know, before I can qualify. So that's what I thought this was. You know, I had no idea what they're talking about. And you can imagine, most people are intimidated as soon as they see these set of acronyms. You know, you are told like, are you in a hub zone? Are you a DBE contractor? Are you an MBE contractor? And believe it or not, it was discouraging enough that for a couple of years, I stepped aside and said, let me grow my business. I'll come back to this. One of the things I noticed immediately was that you tend to lose your hair really fast when you work with the federal government. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm, an ex I'm a fairly good example of that. And I'll give you some stories of what we've run into. Now, why should you work with the federal government? Here's the most important thing. They spend over a trillion dollars in services, acquisitions, in all sorts of processes through our, throughout our country. It's your tax dollars. Remember that. So why won't you want it to be a part of, why won't you want to be a part of that business? Think of it that way. Number one. Number two in there is the process by which they do work is in three main categories. Real estate, products and services, and policy and regulation. Literally, you can find yourself in, if you do have a business or you do work, you can find yourself into any one of these three categories. The only thing they don't do, they're not in the business of funerals. They pretty much do death, real estate, all that, and taxes, but they don't do funerals. That's the only service they don't offer. Other than that, the federal government is in every aspect of corporate life in the US. It's amazing. Now, do you ask me, why would you want to do federal contracting? Think of it this way. Our businesses typically, typically go through a cycle. There's a, a good time, a bad time, a good time. It follows the economic cycle. If you remember what happened in 2008, when the economy took a nosedive, where do you think there was only one agency that was spending money? It was the federal government. It was through the stimulus, which was called the American Recovery and Restoration Act. It was so critical, it's hard to believe, but my company, which had grown to almost 25 people, we were thinking of laying off almost 80% of our staff because there was no work in the private sector. Banks were not lending. It just did not exist. So the way we looked at it was, if we can get a small piece of that pie, okay, the stimulus pie, we can keep our workers employed. So it helps the way of, when you work with the federal government is, it creates what I call a level field in your economic cycle. Instead of going up and down, so if you can come up with a happy mixture of say 50-50, public and private, it really does help your bottom line. And the important thing out there is banks love you if you do federal work. Think of it this way. Your credit worthiness goes through the roof simply because it's backed by the full faith of the federal government. So once you have a federal contract, believe me, you become a lot more suitable as far as uh, getting uh, better credit ratings, getting a loan to expand your business. It works you know, a really good factor. The important thing out here to notice is when you work with the federal government, the contracts are very stable. There's one key reason behind it. You can never sue the federal government. It's important to know that fact. They are immune from lawsuits. So when you work with them, you pretty much are at risk. You're putting out all the work, but on the other hand, you know it's not going to bounce back at you as far as you do a very professional project. But after giving you all those pluses, you should know that you have to prepare for a lot of hand-holding. That means that a lot of end users, think of it this way, when you talk to a bureaucrat or someone you're working with at the federal agencies, they are looking for someone who does not rock the boat. They're looking for stability, okay? So you have to be extremely proactive 
when you work with them. But on the other hand, you should not rock the boat. It's no point going out there and saying, I'll redo this my way. And you have to follow a process that they lay out. It's very important. They hire you because of the stability that you bring to the process, the professionalism that you bring to the process, and the simple fact that you will follow the rules and regulations of the federal government. Just, to, just so you know, the rules of the federal government are classified in a document called the FAR. It's called the Federal Acquisitions and Regulation. That book, the binder which is issued with each contract I sign, even for my contracts that are $500, it's about this thick. Luckily now, it comes electronically. At one time, I used to collect this. I used to collect binders and bring, back, bring it back to my office. But that's a process, and it's not editable. You have to follow the rules and regulation that's happened over the many decades the uh, government has been doing business in the private sector. The important thing out there is their standards are extremely high. I can't um, stress that more. The reason I say that is it's been looked over by lots of lawyers, lots of, I mean, just through pure experience, they have a process that's set in place. They don't like to deviate from that very easily. So if you're an innovator, unless the project calls for some kind of uh, strict, I mean, they ask for innovation, it's best to follow the process that's been given to you. I have to mention that. I, as a little bit of a segue out here to a story when I mean to say of the hand-holding. Um, we do a lot of courthouses in Chicago. And courthouses, the kings of the space are the federal judges. They are appointed for life, they have lifetime appointments. And the day they are appointed, they get a small part of money, say $250,000, to redo their chambers, okay? So if you walk into a federal courthouse, it pretty much, and that's a, it's a one-time deal. They get it when they get appointed. So if you walk into a courthouse, you can literally look at the architecture and design and you know when that particular judge is appointed. So what happened was we were working on a courthouse and this was a judge who was appointed by Ronald Reagan. So 1981, 82. So here he, his space looked 30 years old, fairly drab and whatnot. And I thought, hey, he really wants a full makeover of the space. You know, he really wants us to work on it. His secretary came up to me and said, no, not really. You see that plant out there? It was a little fern like, um, there was a little fern out there. That fern was given to this judge by Ronald Reagan. You move it, you'll lose your job. <laughs> it had nothing to do with my core competency. You see what I mean? So you have to understand your, your end user, your client out here. Who are you working for? So when you work with the various agencies, understand very clearly who you're working for and you have to cater to that process. The main agency that our company works with is the General Services Administration, or GSA. GSA is the largest federal agency that puts out contracts in, you can name it, they work in supplies, services, they manage office spaces, they, they lease it out, they buy spaces, they build. They are a huge agency with a budget of over $500 billion a year. It's an amazing amount, think about it, that's bigger than what Apple does or Microsoft does put together. It's an enormous amount of money that they work through. They have over 12,000 employees and they don't do any work in-house. By law, they have to do work externally. So think of it as a central agency with all these arms that reach out into the community. If you can get your finger in that pie, you're going to do really well. It's a lot of money that's spent each year. And the money is appropriated by the US Congress. So in many instances, the projects are coming down the pipeline for a long time. So if you follow, um, if you follow the news, if you are in touch with your local agencies, you can actually see projects that are coming down. Nothing happens suddenly. It's, you never hear about a courthouse that's being built or they're going to um, break ground on it tomorrow. They're almost five to 10 years in the making. It's a long, slow process. So if you have your uh, years to the ground, you know what the projects are that are coming. 
and you listen out and then you start to form teams, which is what I will get to in my next slide. Now we get to the real secrets. There are four P's that you need to have. You need to have tremendous amount of patience. It is no point getting frustrated and going you know, around the project manager you usually work with or you're trying to work with, going to his or her boss and saying, I'm frustrated, it will not work. You cannot rock the boat. I have to repeat that again and again. You need to have tremendous amount of patience. The easiest way to break in, I mean, you can be Einstein. You could have an awesome firm, but unless you have someone who's already worked with them, it always helps to partner with someone who has worked with a federal agency. It's a lot easier to come in as a subconsultant and then become a consultant. The first time around, because they want to see how you work with them, they're not going to hire an unknown agency despite recommendations. It purely works on, this guy works well with us, the next time we'll give him his own contract. Think of it that way. You need to be persistent. The first time you knock at the door, it doesn't work, let it be, walk away, come back again. The fourth time, you need to have professionalism. I can't stress this enough. You must be extremely professional when you work. You have, I mean, if you're an architect, I go there to talk architect, architecture to them. I'm not talking about meeting them at a coffee house. You cannot do that simply because their hands are tied by fairly strict regulations. You can, I mean, the, you know, when you, how we break bread in the private industry does not work in the public sector, simply because they're risk averse. They don't want to be seen that they're showing favoritism. It's a very codified, classified process by which a contract is written. So be extremely professional, very, very important. You know, you can build a relationship over years, but the important thing out here is knowing the fact that I'm approaching you to give you a service that I'm qualified in. Now, the various streams. There's obviously, you've heard of DBE contracts, the disadvantaged business enterprises. If you're a veteran, it's a great uh, field to be in. 8A certification, people will ask me like, I could get into a lot of detail, but I'll try and just be cursory over some of these processes. The 8A certification is a time-based certification. It, you apply for the certification, it's valid, for small businesses over a certain threshold in revenues. And over that certain period, you become basically a highly eligible suitor to work with. And other companies that are not 8A, larger companies, will team with you. They will seek you out because you get published as an 8A qualified firm. It's an amazing certification to hold. It's a little bit difficult to get hold of, but believe it or not, if you're persistent, you fill up the forms, there are a lot of private agencies that can come and help you in this process, but once again, I always stress it out to people that it's not that hard if you're willing to put in the time. And then you want to get on schedule. What is schedule, being on schedule? It's essentially a pre-publication in the sense that if you offer or you sell a product, you are publishing the prices at which you will sell to the federal government. So if you're selling computers, you're selling a service, you're selling paper, you name it, pins, supplies. You're basically entering into a contract with the federal government saying that I will sell to you at this price over this period of time and essentially there's no bid in this process after that. If they need that particular supply, they reach out to you, say, you know, Ramesh, how much are you going to provide, how, many, how much is it going to cost totally if I want to buy 500,000 reams of paper, multiply it by the price that you had published and voila, the contract's done. Simple, straightforward. IDIQ is the indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. It's not the one that I showed you in the second slide. It's definitely not that. So it's a very valuable certification to hold. Unfortunately, it's not available at all times. It's a very specific certification that comes at limited times, but on the other hand, it's the fastest way for the federal government to get services. So for example, during the downturn in 2008, 2009, they put out a number of IDIQ contracts throughout the various regions of the General Services Administration. The Veterans Department does it, HUD does it, you name it, hospital, 
the various agencies that do, all, do the same process. So the IDIQ term is fairly um, common for all the various agencies. But getting one of those contracts is great because they can only come to you, you enter into a contract directly, it's a no-bid contract. If you are familiar in the real world, in public sector work, everything is public bidding, but if you have an IDIQ contract, it isn't. It's a very simple process. It sounds very intimidating when they say you need to fill out an SF-330 form. Essentially, they're, all they're asking you for is your resume. So think of it this way. The no documentation that's required for the certification processes sounds intimidating. It is not when you have the opportunity. These are the simple steps that you need to get through. You must get this work. You can't, cannot work on any federal contract without having this process done. You need to have a CCR, which is the Central Contractor Registration. It's available, once you register on this one, it's available nationwide to any project manager. They just type your name in and out will pop your, all your information on your company. You will also be on system, uh, the System Award Management, which is SAM, which is the, now the all-encompassing agency that controls this process. When you get paid, your, license, your tax ID number, everything is in there. You have electronic payments that are made to you. It's instantaneous. And the federal government, believe it or not, pays you within 10 to 15 days of invoicing. No other public sector does it as fast. There was a time during the stimulus time, during, the, uh, during 2009, we were getting paid in five days. It was amazing, and, and if they don't, they were paying us interest. No other agency that I worked with has ever paid me interest. They've always asked me for a deal, but they want to cut my fee. Um, and of course, you need to have a Dun & Bradstreet number. You need to have what, what they call contractor performance reviews. Very, very important. Once again, remember I told you about don't rock the boat? The simple thing is they want to see what your past experience has been, what your reviews look like. They need to see this. And this is done, again, through Dun & Bradstreet. You have to um, give them 20 references, and they call them blindly. They get the information. It's categorized and put inside your record. It's available for any project manager to, be, to see nationwide. And finally, you need to be able to register on federal business, op federal business opportunities, the FBO site, and you have what's called the NAICS number. That's the North American Industries Classification System, NAICS. Every business, uh, every service that's offered has a particular number, a category that, that's uh, listed by the NAICS. Once you place that into the FBO, it shows you all the opportunities that are available for you. You can basically do a subset in my own region. You can be nationwide. You can say, I only want to do this work. But having that NAICS code is critical because that's your core competency. So if you don't have an NAICS code, you'll, you will not be able to find the business that you want to work with. It, that's where the intimidation factor comes in. You cannot walk into a federal office and say, hey, I'm an architect, I can do work. They'll say, what kind of architecture do you do? Do you do dams? Do you do courthouses? Do you do police stations? Do you build roads? All of these have numbers. You need to know the number, and that must be registered at the FBO site, and you pull out. On a, literally, once you put in the codes, the information comes back to you constantly. I mean, literally every day, my phone beeps on opportunities that are being published. You don't have to chase down every one of them, but at least have the process that, hey, I'm going to chase down this particular project in the Chicago area, or I'm going to chase it down in the California area. You have the opportunity. So once you get through this process, the federal contracting becomes a lot less daunting. And my fellow speakers, I'm sure, will shed more light on it, but that's what I want to share with you. And of course, um, you should always have your prerequisites, as what I call them. You must have your federal tax ID. You have to be a business. You have to have a registered business. You cannot go there, walk in, and say, you know, I used to be an architect. I used to work at a company. No, it doesn't work that way. You need to have certain prerequisites that go about it. You must have a bank account. You must have paid your taxes. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> you can get to a award. And at that point, they can still kick you off if your record shows that you're delinquent in your taxes. 
very, very important to know you need to have a legal entity registered to do business in the United States, important. And they have a lot of classifications, rules and whatnot, but by and large, if you're a legitimate business, you really should not struggle with this. I'm just putting this out there so that you understand what's, what, what needs to be done. SF-330 essentially is your resumes. It's, it categorizes all the work that you've done over the years. It's a chronological resume. It just fills in the boxes. Again, it just sounds intimidating. It is not as tough. Last but not the least, you're free, feel free to contact me and maybe we can team up. Maybe we can do some work together. We'll have the opportunity to work together. And uh, I really look forward to, quest to the questions that you may throw at us soon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, presentation. <clears throat> Ramesh said uh, why you should get into federal business. And uh, hopefully I can cover how you can get into federal business in addition to some of the things he quoted. I'm glad we are having the question and answer session because at the end, because some of the questions you may have, I might answer with in my presentation. Uh, so before I uh, embark upon uh, some of the methodologies that uh, uh, opportunities in federal business, I just want to say who I am and what is it that we do and what is our uh, claim to fame so far in Orange County wise. Uh, so my name is Venu Saraki. I'm the CEO of Saraki Associates. Uh, we have been in, uh, so one of the things you distinguish yourself, you know, you, when you say something, who you are, it has to be uh, efficient, effective, and compelling. So let's say you met someone uh, 30 seconds in the elevator. What do you say when you, somebody asks you, what is it that you do? So you have to distinguish yourself within that 30 seconds or five seconds, what is it that you do? But in a federal government level, there are thousands and thousands. So one thing that you can say who you are, what do you do? So the, the top says, for example, top performance rated, which is a very coveted thing in federal government. Uh, award winning, that's one more thing, right? Multidisciplinary. And then if you see one more bullet that says, I have not missed a deadline in 15 years, right? Those immediately are uh, good green flags. Oh, this guy is something I need to talk about. Anyway, uh, we'll touch upon that later. But uh, we do information technology, homeland security, essentially US-Mexico border control to stop illegal immigrants. I am a legal immigrant. I just want to tell you that. <laughs> um, and then intelligent transportation system. Anything that you see on the freeway, traffic control systems, uh, toll collection system, Amber Alert system, we started as designing those things. Uh, infrastructure engineering, some of the things that Ramesh was talking about. Uh, you know, okay, next slide, good. Uh, I want to get a, uh, give an impression or a size. How do we, uh, how do we put our arms around the federal government and say what it is? I know there are several uh, different uh, budget variations here. But I took only those amount that federal government gives out to contractors and consultants. And that's about $600, $600 billion with a B. And out of that $600 billion, uh, I think Ramesh uh, did mention that we, federal government is the largest procurer of goods and uh, services in the world. Uh, so there are goals. These are goals and not a hard target. Um, 5% to women-owned business, small disadvantage, about 5%. Uh, uh, within that small disadvantaged business, there are very small, where up to 25,000, you don't need a competitive bidding. And then there is another uh, slab, up to 125,000, you don't need a competitive bidding. Uh, and then hub zone means historically underutilized business zone. These are mostly trailer parks. It's very hard to find talent in these places. But there are other places where where you really will luck out, like entire UCI campus is a hub zone. So the criteria there is 60% uh, of the uh, population should be doing less than 50% of the income uh, in a given uh, statistical area. For example, a lot of UCI professors are there, they make a lot of money, but the students don't make a lot of money. 
So as a, this very, this is one of the unintended consequences of rule making. <laughs> so it so happened that it's a beautiful area, excellent campus, everything is top A class, and you can locate your business and still call yourself hub zone. <laughs> so in fact, I am trying to look for some uh, <laughs> rental places there. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so there are nearly 2,000 federal agencies. Um, for example, if you take Department of Defense, you have Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, Coast Guard, right? And then each one has its own. So that's why it adds up to 2,000, uh, approximately 2,000 agencies, and all of these are decentralized. That means Army follows its own 23%, Navy follows its own 23%, and that's uh, then at the end they uh, combine all these and then uh, give the report to Congress. Next slide, please. Uh, so where do we start? I know Ramesh gave a lot of good points. I think the best thing to start is sba.gov. This is a very nebulous site, let me say. I think uh, Ramesh they gave a good job, but uh, I think if you are uh, in a local area, for example, Santa Ana, if you are in Orange County, I think actually entire Southern California is controlled by uh, Santa Ana. You can virtually go there, and this is one of the cases, they say, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. It is true, they are here to help you. So um, you go talk to them and see what you want to do, and they can guide you. And there are also, I can give you, I mean, a lot of consultants, like Ramesh said. Uh, I can give you some uh, names where you can go, you pay two or three or three or four thousand dollars, they'll get you ATA certified, provided you have all the records and you are legal. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, you can call me if you have any questions. I'll give my uh, information later. Next slide, please. Uh, I think I said this is self sales pitch, and this is important. Uh, what do you stand for? What is your core competency? Because you really don't want to start something that you don't know. If you have an idea, it doesn't really matter, because that is a very small part. Everything that federal government wants to do, it has to be written somewhere, scope of work, right? You stick to that scope of work, you won't get into trouble. But if you have some innovation ideas, then you can go to SBR, Small Business Innovation. Uh, is it something SBIR? Yeah. That's another up to 250,000. If you think it's an excellent Nobel uh, laureate idea, you can go to uh, these places and you can pitch your idea. Again, there is competition. Uh, I wanted to say uh, one more thing is uh, uh, you need to have a past performance. So when I started in 1994, uh, for nearly 10 years, I didn't even touch the federal government. I will, I will talk to you how I stumbled upon federal government contracting later on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'll talk to you about my experience. And uh, if you really look, I, I just want to bring one uh, aspect here. If you look at the pyramid on the right, there are 27 million businesses in the United States. And 23 million do not have any employees. It's self-employed, sole source, right? And uh, about one to four is about three million, and about uh, five to nine is about two million. Here is the most startling statistics for me. Less than half a percent of all businesses in United States, that means nearly 18, less than half percent, have only more than 500 employees. That's it. You can see small business is a very big business. 80 percent or 75 or 80, I forget, but Entire US job growth comes through this uh, small business. So you don't have to be ashamed to say you are a small business. Uh, one, one, one second. Um, <clears throat> the most important thing is relationship, networking, and continuous marketing is very, very critical. If you get a project, if you are working on it, don't ignore the next step, which is that's going to get over. And you need to be marketing when you are also are busy. All right? And allot 12 to 24 federal months. I'm calling it federal because sometimes they work off of a different calendar than we are. Uh, for us, one day is 24 hours. For them, it could be different. Uh, so you have to be in it in order to win it. Now, one of the things, if you really want to be a federal contractor, you can become one. I'm assuming we are all legal and we have paid our taxes and things like that. So it depends how badly do you want it, right? Uh, essentially, to me, if I wanted one, I said, I have all the requirements. I'll become one. So there was no plan B. 
I, didn't, I never thought, what if I don't become a federal contractor? Uh, it's a lot of paperwork, uh, and uh, at the end, I think it's worth it. So next slide, please. So this is uh, interesting charts. Uh, I wanted to show, on the left-hand side, is a top 10 federal agencies in spending 2012. Uh, of course, Department of Defense, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines comes first. Uh, these are all contracts uh, that generally go to Northrop Grumman, uh, Martin Marietta, or uh, you know, BAE Systems, Boeing, these are, right? You can go as a subcontractor, but first, the first thing they say is, fill, go fill out our vendor uh, list. There will be 8,000 or 10,000 people. It's useless. It's, it's really not worth going after those things. Um, and then on the right side, uh, this is what I like, is these are the agencies that select small businesses as prime contractors. So it's very interesting because this is what you want to be. This is where you want to be. If you are an 8A or a small business, up to $4 million, if you are qualified, you can get uh, without competition, provided you have the financial capability, you have the talent, you have the skills, you have the um, experience doing that kind of project. So I would say, to me, uh, being a prime, you get the glory, you get the fame, of course you get the blame too, the buck stops with you. So you have to be ready for all those things. The next slide, please. So this is, uh, I, I wanted to tell you how I stumbled upon into the federal government. Uh, you know, I came, uh, I came from a village called Saraki in Bangalore. And I'm from an agricultural family with, an, with nine kids, and I'm the middle. And uh, my mom, who is standing there, never went to uh, uh, school. She doesn't know how to read or write. So our entire sustenance, and that's all the piece of furniture we had in the entire house. Adjacent to our house was the cattle shed, right? And our income fr came from, it all depended on monsoon rain. If the monsoon rain failed, you didn't have two meals a day or three meals a day. You just had one. Uh, Anyway, from there, I, somehow my mom had the intention of pushing all of us to go read or do something. And uh, I stumbled upon another person who drove a car in our village, and I went and asked him, how come you have a car, and what do you do? Uh, it, I was very curious, and he said, you have to work hard. I said, I already work very hard in the farm. So he said, no, no, work hard means you have to do your homework. He gave me all the tips, so I did all that went to engineering, went to IIT Madras, and at IIT Madras, one of the professors from Michigan State, he took a, a class, bridge structures, and I was participating in that. I did well. So he asked me, would you like to come to America? At that point, we didn't have um, money for the plane ticket. I asked my mom. She was a little bit worried. I asked my dad, go, there are eight more kids. What do I do with them? You can go. Uh, so he was very happy to send me off. So we sold half acre of land for the plane and came, of course, the rest is history. And uh, in 1995, I uh, started my own business. Uh, I worked for 10 years with the local agencies or uh, uh, contractors who worked for federal contracts or uh, state contracting. And uh, we did, this is the turning point in our uh, company, at least. There is a uh, State Route 60, Pomona Freeway. So, in 12 years ago, we wanted to convert the entire truck lane to completely automate. The moment they get onto uh, the freeway 710 at the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, until they go to the Inland Empire, each truck is only five feet apart. Think about autonomous vehicle that Google is trying to do. So we did that about 12 years ago for trucks on Route 60 with US, UC Berkeley technology. It was only $90,000 project, and I hired them to just to review my report. But you know, you have UC Berkeley backing a, a university like UC Berkeley backing Saraki Associate, which nobody has heard. So it was picked up by India West. And we had uh, identified the RFID technology. We had identi identified the short range communication system, fail, fail system. What if the driver is dunk, drunk? at the exit, who is going to take care of the truck, what if there is an accident, so all the operational scenarios, we had played it out. And this is some of this RFID technology had to be done at the US-Mexico border. So somebody uh, one day called me and said, look, we have 
a project. I, I saw your article in Google search from India West. This is something similar we want to do at the US-Mexico border. We want to install RFID technology. But I see you're not a federal contractor. I would like to ask you to go as a sub to another contractor. It's a small, uh, it's a small project, they said. OK, I said, OK, this is another $50,000, $60,000. At that time, we were doing 300000 And then out of curiosity, can I ask you how much is the project? He said it's $3.3 .3 million. I wanted to say, where do I sign? But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I said, OK, all right, uh, it looks like a reasonable amount. I want to see what the, what the requirements are. Um, Anyway, I got the project, and then after, so th what you see, the, the green arrows here, that's the, uh, what's called Sentry, Secure Electronic Network for Travelers Rapid Inspection. These are the people who stay on the Mexico side, Tijuana, and come to Walmarts and Kmarts in the San Diego area, work the uh, shifts, and then go back to uh, San Diego. What we wanted to do is ask them to come into this lane so that we can track them. And so they make sure in the evening they go back, right? So that was the technology. We said we're going to, mm. so their average waiting time went down from two hours waiting to cross the border to seven minutes. In the process, we got the Outstanding Engineering Excellence Award because uh, early morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, they had, uh, they had announced 8 o'clock is the opening of the lane, but 4 o'clock, the guy who's supposed to do the lane marking, he just quit. And then I had to do it myself. Um, so all my shoe was on, in white color. But anyway, so the client saw this and, th and thought, OK, I can do this. And then he asked me, hey, are you a federally certified, are you an 8A contractor? I was on 8A for five years. I never approached any project because I was OK doing what I was doing. And I said, yes. And then the next four projects, next five projects, that was about three and a half, four million, we did it on as a prime. And after that, we did three more. You know, how many do you need? Just one, one contract changes your, your, the way you feel about finances, the way you feel about uh, you know, that your outlook on life changes, trust me. Uh, anyway, the rest is history. Uh, so I went from that farmhouse to the White House, uh, July 11th. <laughs> July 11th, I was invited. I was one of the few contractors who worked with the federal government and had uh, written a letter to uh, the Small Business Administration stating that you need to change your federal contracting methods because it, apl it applies to so many, 78% of these small businesses. You need to do A, B, C, D. And then I, see a, I receive a phone call and say, this is the president's office. I hang up. It's a prank call, <laughs> right? <laughs> And then I see it says uh, uh, White House. I say, yeah, I'm going to fall for that again, right? And then I didn't pick up. And then Small Business Administration from Santa Ana called me and said, that is the White House. Please pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I was invited. And uh, there were th 30 guys who were from AT&T, Apple, and IBM, Walmart. I was the small business voice. So I had, uh, I had to go through three layers of security. We said. Uh, I know everything about you. We know your date of birth, who you are married to, all your, uh, when you flew about 10 years ago, you went to some, they knew everything about me. All we want is 30 seconds, tell me why, what we have to change with the federal contracting. When I started speaking, Obama <coughs> said stop. Actually, before that, when he walked in, that's the first time you feel the effect of the presidency, right? It's the presidency, not the man itself, the corridors of power. Everybody stood up. It was such a pin drop silence. That's the time it hits you, right? This is the most powerful man in the world. And I'm fortunate to meet the sitting president of the United States. Apart from that, I think when he asked uh, me questions, I, I answered. And he said, uh, first of all, I don't have to dip into my personal savings, which makes my tiger wife happy. And uh, he said, I have a wife like that in, the, in this house. <laughs> so because he was talking about Obama and it was White House, so it, it was good, uh, good uh, conversation. Anyway, with that, I think uh, that's enough. But the good place to start is SBA.gov. And there are, it's really a lot of paperwork. But I'm here to help, just like the federal government. And uh, I mean it. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions after this. <laughs> Thank you.
I met Harina through Sam. Sam is, is my IT guy. He is my go-to IT guy. And Sam works for, for, for my company, FCI. He has helped us go to the next level in our IT space. And we really were at a point in time in our growth when we were looking to do something a little different, get rid of all those 15, 20 servers we had in the closet there. And we met Sam, and we hired him to come in and help us go to uh, the cloud, to Office 365. So Sam is our go-to IT guy, but Sam introduced us to Harina, and Harina and I are now working together on solar, and that is the basis of networking. So thank you, Harina, for having me here today. Um, Ramesh and um, Venu have told you a lot about federal government and the secrets, and they have really told you all the secrets. I want to tell you a little bit about how we have prepared ourselves to do federal contracting. So I'm going to take it in just a little bit different direction. Button the post. Oh, nice. But first, let me give you a little bit about our company. Um, we're FCI Management. We, uh, our mission is to provide expertise and knowledge and leadership in the to our customers, delivering innovative strategies and solutions in the energy and water industries, making a positive impact on climate change, and. We've been in, I've been in business now for 16 years, just to tell you a little bit about my background. I worked for Southern California Edison for 22 years, had an opportunity to take an early retirement, or maybe you want to call it a golden handshake. I like the golden handshake better because I was way too early for me to retire. But I took the package and I always had that little entrepreneurial bug and I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. Wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do started the company and actually started bringing retirees back to work at Southern California Edison. So we started out working in the transmission distribution business unit, working on uh, distribution design work, electrical distribution grid. And then in 2001, when we had this big energy crisis, I said, oh shoot, they're going to they're going to cut back on contractors. They're not going to need these guys to come in here and work on infrastructure anymore. What are we going to do? And I said, oh, I know. We're having an energy crisis, and energy efficiency is going to be the hottest thing going. And that was back in 2001. And so that has really taken over and become the core competency of our company. Okay. I'm going to stand out here a little bit so I can see. <coughs> So this is who we are. Since we started in the energy efficiency realm, we offer energy solutions and strategies to our customers. We focus on corporate, residential, commercial, industrial clients, public schools, private schools, universities. And we really provide services to the utility companies because we actually implement their energy efficiency programs for them. Um, we've had over 150,000 retrofit projects. And one of the things I want to point out, just in terms of what we do, we had a 90, actually that's wrong, it says 95% customer satisfaction rating, we have a 98% customer satisfaction rating. And because we do a customer satisfaction on every single project we do, that's how we measure that we're delivering excellent customer service, and that's really important. Again, we were established in 1998. And we talked about all of these things that you need for federal government, so here's ours. Here's our federal ID number, here's our DUNS number, we got a cage code, we have all of our license here, we're a licensed electrical contractor in California, we're also a general contractor, and the new certification which says CalCEP, CalTIP acceptance text test technician has to do with the new Title 24 building codes, and we are certified to do that. Those are all our NACE codes. Now you notice that we have quite a few NACE codes. And he talked about the importance of knowing what your NACE codes are because your NACE codes are your core competency. It is the area in which you want to do business with the federal government, but not only the federal government, but governmental agencies, which include state, local governments, public schools, universities, colleges. MTA, transportation, any of those governmental agencies are going to ask you what your NACE codes are. <laughs> so we have several. Some of them are consulting NACE codes. All of the ones in the five category are consulting NACE codes. The other ones are more on the building side. They're um, commercial and institutional construction, facilities management support, and electrical contracting. 
and this is our areas of expertise. I won't read them off all to you, but um, we, we focus on energy efficiency technology and lighting um, controls, HVAC refrigeration, water efficiency retrofits. We also do energy assessments. So that's actually going into the building, looking at the buildings, doing an, an audit or retro commissioning, identifying what energy efficiency opportunities are in those buildings. Uh, we look at utility bills and do analysis. And of course, we have our energy management systems, demand response technology, program development management, and training. And here's our client base. Our clients are corporations. It's a list of the corporations that have done business with us. Utilities have been by far our largest customers. Probably about 80% of the work that we have done has been with utility companies. And notably, Southern California Edison is my largest customer. Doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I used to work for them. It's kind of mm -hmm. nice. But I think it has a lot to do with knowing what the customer wants and understanding how to deliver that service. So we were fortunate enough to bid competitively for a contract, it, win that contract. And we've had that same contract now for over 12 years. We have bid it again, and we won it again. So just want to say that, um, that typically those contracts aren't that long, but we've been fortunate enough to have that. And we've also worked with some governmental agencies, Los Angeles County. We actually just won a uh, bid to build a carport solar system for LA County. We're really excited. We're probably about 30% through that project now. We'll start construction on that, and that's just really going to be a real signature project for us. Uh, we've done work for the city of Anaheim, primarily back when we were doing the distribution design work, um, and for the cities of Rolling Hills, Temecula, and city of Lawndale, we've done a lot of stuff, or, uh, a lot of stuff, <laughs> a lot of things around the energy efficiency arena, helping them with strategies, technologies, or retrofits. But what I want to, what I want to really point out here is this is part of preparing ourselves for what I think is the bigger picture, which is the opportunity to do business with the federal government. This is where we're going to get our past performance from. You could call it baby steps, but I call it big steps to develop and diversify your client base so that when you are actually going after those federal contracts, as we are doing right now, we have all of the history and past performance that will be needed for us to win those contracts. What's next? And this is really just some of the types of programs and projects that we've done. In the residential, non-residential direct install program, uh, we have, um, we say 150,000 retrofits. It actually means that we've gone into 150,000 different types of commercial facilities. Doesn't matter it was, whether it's a restaurant or an office building, whether it's a grocery store or a liquor store or a large medical building, we pr pretty much have touched and retrofitted every type of building that there is. And we've provided many types of, and we have a whole, probably thousands of measures that we can retrofit on the lighting side, on the air conditioning side, on the re refrigeration side. Uh, we've also, um, the Orange County Cities Partnership, we're an implementer. We just provide technical support to five cities that have come together to talk about and uh, strategize on how to deliver energy efficiency to their communities. Um, we also did a retrofit in 20 different cities as part of our direct install program. So we have retrofit libraries, fire departments, city halls, city yards, you name it. We've probably touched most of the municipal type facilities too. Uh, we had an opportunity to do some work with uh, Southern California Edison's private schools program and one of the I think most innovative projects we did was at Pepperdine University where we actually went into the classroom and installed an occupancy control that controlled not only their lighting, but it also controlled the variable speed bo volume boxes which control the air conditioning. So when there's nobody in the classroom, no lights, no air, and they save money. And so we're really proud of that. 
We also do residential programs. We do um, the Energy Saving Assistance Program, which is a low-income program. I happen to be a member of the Low Income Oversight Board for the California Public Utilities Commission, but we work with both the gas company and Southern California Edison doing weatherization. We do the outreach and we actually do the installations of it, and it includes furnace repair, um, blowing in insulation, and those types of measures. And then I already mentioned the uh, Los Angeles County uh, carport, solar carport system that we're building. And last but not least, we have been able to build ourselves a national presence. So with US Bank as our client, we have been retrofitting their branches uh, nationally, we have actually, we're up to six different states where we have gone in and retrofitted uh, branches of US Bank. And I think I already talked about being on the Low Income Oversight Board, so we'll move on to the next slide. So this is what I wanted to tell you about doing business with the federal government. First of all, the certifications. So we have gone through the process now of getting ourselves certified. We started the process of 8A certification uh, actually a little over a year ago and I put a stop to it because the one thing that I know is that if you want to do business with the federal government, you need to have someone on your staff, if not yourself, that focuses on nothing but working the federal government because it's a process. That's true. It's a process, and you have to work that process every single day. You have to understand all of the things that these gentlemen had talked about earlier. You have to understand what Fed biz ops is. You have to understand what sources thought is. I mean, there's all of these components of it that you have to understand before you even get to a contract. So you really need someone who's going to be laser focused on building the federal government. And I think I got kind of lucky because in December, my daughter, made a conscientious choice to join our company. Now, my mm -hmm. daughter lives in Atlanta, and she was director of human resources for the city of Atlanta at the airport. And you do know that the ATL is one of the largest airports in the, the United busiest, States. Yeah. So for her to make that decision on her own, to say, one, I think it's time to come into the family business, and two, I want to help build that national presence, and I think the federal government is doing it. And man, she's doing an amazing job right now, penetrating and uh, uh, focusing on getting into the federal government. And I'll tell you some of the things that she's doing. But um, I wanted to just talk about that, you know, there's challenges. The challenges are you have to learn how to do business with the federal government. And I want to emphasize what, what, what these gentlemen said before about working with the SBA because they give you classes on how to do business with the federal government. They'll tell you how to get into SAM and how to get your CCR. They'll tell you how to put together your business plan, your capability statement, all of these things that you need to be able to market yourself to the federal government. Because it's not so easy. It's not just going in there and saying, hey, there's a contract. I think I can do that. Let me have that. It's not that easy. There's a lot of steps to it, and you have to prepare yourself so that you have a professional approach to getting these contracts. Um, one of the things that we're doing, and we're really laser focused on this, is seeking opportunities to be a subcontractor with prime contractors who are already doing business in the federal government in particular in our space, in the energy efficiency space. Because if you remember, President Obama issued an executive order, and I think this was probably somewhere around 2009, that basically said that he wanted every federal building to be energy retrofitted for energy efficiency by 2020. And then I think that he's, they've added it, um, uh, there was a certain percentage, I think 30% by 2020, and now it's 50% by 2050. And he also said that he wanted these buildings to be retrofit at no cost to the taxpayer. So the only way that that could be done is what, what they call energy service performing con 
performance contracting. And that is basically where a prime contractor comes in and does all of the retrofits, finances the entire project, and then bills it back to the government over a period of time. And then he's put in a margin and interest, and that's how they get paid. They usually do this off of an IDIQ contract issued by the Department of Industry. So since that's our space, and I can't afford to float the government that kind of money, we have been looking at teaming with these prime contractors. Now, the caveat here is the prime contractors have to do 30% business with minority, women-owned, service-disabled veteran businesses, 8A businesses, hub zone businesses. It's a requirement. So the opportunity for you to work with these larger contractors and get a subcontract is great. And so that's one of the areas that we are really focusing on is getting subcontracts with these contractors. And just recently, the Department of Energy had what they call these industry days. They had them across the United States. We attended three different industry days. One in uh, Virginia. My daughter went to the one in Virginia. I have an office also in New York, so I had one of my New York staff go to the one in New York, and I attended personally the one that was here in Sacramento. And the prime contractors are there. They're there to talk to the smaller businesses because they are looking for you to do business on their contracts because they're required to include you on the contracts. Oh. So the other thing I wanted to mention too is also about attending government conferences. So they do have them, I just mentioned the Department of Industry, Industry Days. Uh, there's a procurement conference that's held in, um, in uh, Washington, D.C. once a year that you can go and it generally a lot of the agencies will come out, they will talk to you about upcoming contracts, they'll give you, you know, give you an opportunity to sort of pitch your business to them and then they can give you some direction. They're there to talk to you, that is a great time to market. So attending government conferences and they have different events. In fact, there's one that's going to be here in Santa Ana in a couple of weeks. It's an 8A contract and it's being sponsored by the SBA office here. And just because it says it's an 8A contract, if you're not an 8A uh, contractor, it doesn't mean that you can't go. In fact, it really means you should go. <laughs> because that's an opportunity for you to learn. They'll be doing some seminars, and again, they'll have some prime contractors there, and they may even have some agency there. They'll hold them in San Diego and all the different places that you might want to do business. And then I said, follow the information highway. There is a way for you to identify an opportunity for yourself. If you've gotten your certification and you have any of those designations, and you want to start talking about about set-aside contracts, 8A, woman-owned small business, service-disabled veteran business, then the first thing you need to become familiar with is sources sought. Because generally speaking, an agency will send out a sources sought. You guys familiar with the sources sought, right? They'll send out a sources sought for a contract, and they're looking for people who can, it's like a pre-qualification. And so you submit your pre-qualification for that source of thought, but you have to know that the source of thought is there. That means that you have to do the, the looking for it, the mining for it, and getting the information. Uh, the other thing is FedBizOps. That's where all the contracts are listed on FedBizOps. And then for each and every agency, they do forecasts. They forecast what contra contracts are going to be coming up for the next year, what money they're going to be spending, and where they're going to be spending it. So if you know what the forecast is and you see a contract that you might be interested in, then you can prepare yourself to get that contract. <coughs> so these are all of our certifications. I might be the networking queen, but I am really the certification queen because I think it's important. And let me tell you why. The certifications I have, federal, you know, SBA certified woman owned small business and economically disadvantaged woman owned small business. But we're also, also certified by 
Women Business Enterprise National Council, also called WeBank. WeBank is the only agency that certifies women-owned businesses. Why is this good? Because the WeBank is an organization that supports women-owned business. They don't only certify them, but they support them. They support them in helping them find federal contracts. They support them in helping them find government contracts. They support them with different seminars and workshops that you can go to that will enhance your ability to do business. And also, we're cert certified with the National Minority Supplier Development Council, and the Southern California has a chapter, and recently we actually, I invited Sam to come out and participate in the event here, and he was one of the exhibitors there. It's a real good organization for not only just being certified, but also for networking with other small businesses. And these are just other organizations that I belong to. But I do want to point out the last one, Women Impacting Public Policy. This last one I just recently joined. And that one is also very focused on helping women own businesses find, find federal contracts. They are headquartered in Washington, D.C. They're involved from a policy standpoint. They're involved at the procurement level. They speak to you personally, and they really help you, women uh, businesses, find federal contracts. And that's pretty much it. Um, the last thing I'll say, uh, I was talking to someone earlier today, and we were talking about not having revenue, so that when you go in to sign up for SAM or CCR and get the revenue, say, how much revenue have you made? It's zero dollars, and it won't take it. But one of the things that you can do to help build your business is to do business with each other. I do business with Sam, Serena, Harina and I do business together. That helps to build your business and it helps to build your revenue stream. And it also helps to get your past performance. I've done past performances for friends of mine that I do business with and I just fill it out and tell them how wonderful they are, what a great job they do, and they use that as their past performance. So that is one way of, of uh, working together to enhance your individual businesses collectively, we can do a lot. And with that, I thank you. Are there any citizenship resolutions? <laughs> you know, with respect to doing business with the federal contracts, contracts. And then to, I think Ramesh mentioned about getting paid actually pretty fast. Uh, is that a common low, or is that only on select contracts? I mean, if you can probably, because one of the things that I had as a small business, working with city governments in Southern California, we never got paid. <laughs> I mean, we got paid like after six months, you know, so I had to sort of literally take a back seat in those. So I just, if you can highlight those two things, that would be great value to me. Uh, and then I think one of the things that you know, you talked about was multidisciplinary, and you know, specifically anything related to IT area with respect to services rather than products. Is that a viable option? So that's. Let me try and take it for the first time. Um, your citizenship question. No, it's irrelevant uh, unless you're working on a high security project with Department of Defense. It really doesn't matter. I became a U.S. citizen many years after I started my company, and it was never a question. As I said, you just need to be a legitimate business, and you have to have a bank record, the tax ID. But it never even came up as a question. Your second, que uh, second part was getting paid. Um, they have moved to an electronic payment system, I would say, 15 years ago. Okay, so once your invoice has been placed and has been approved, even in the, what I would call the go slow process, if you want to call it that, you get paid within less than 20 days. It's been amazing. It's, it's not like any state agency. I worked with multiple state agencies, city agencies, very poor and uh, very slow in paying. So that's never an, uh, an issue. The last question was IT. Absolutely. There are, again, if you fill out the NAICS code, there is an IT code. And there are, in fact, I would almost say, as many service-oriented contracts out there for IT as in construction and architecture. I've never seen a shortage of those. In fact, we roll in 
we do a lot of work with other IT companies in our projects who are brought into and we team up with them very frequently. You want to add to that? That's okay. I got um, it. <coughs> there are a couple of uh, things where, for example, if you want to be hub zone certified, you have to be a US citizen and uh, you have to be earning 51 percent and 35% uh, of your staff, working staff have to come from the hub zone um, located. Um, so I think you are right um, on the, if to get federal contract unless it's uh, classified you don't need. Uh, but if you are a company, if you have citizenship it helps in federal contracting because it builds a trust and uh, bond I think. But uh, that's, that's, that's a different, co but for certain like hub zone, yeah. Uh, 541, 512, these are the Nike code, North American Industrial Classification. IT is probably one of the common thread that runs through entire 2000 agencies of the federal government. It's a very big budget. Uh, it's so big, uh, like Boeing, Northrop Grumman, all these guys are into federal contracting with these kinds of things. Um, it is, it is it's a big deal. The subcontracting, what are the specifications, like you know, the pre-qualification for a subcontractor? You know, like say you guys are like contracting directly with the agencies. If we want, if any company wants to become a subcontractor, then do they need like all of no. the criteria? I, I'll take that one. So if you are a subcontractor at all, you don't need to have to do anything other than what we ask you to give us. You don't have to go to the federal government. Do you really all the certification like FCP, yes. registers, uh, unless there is a dollar amount? Uh, right. Uh, for the most part, um, as a subcontractor, you are bound to the prime and not to the federal government. Yeah. Yeah. The federal government only contracts with one single company, which would be the prime. So as far as you're delivering the services through the prime to the federal government, you don't need to hold all those certifications. But on the other hand, if you're being put as part of a requirement, like the 30 percent, you know, minority or disadvantaged business, then yes, you can hold all certifications that are required to meet that goal. But if you are coming in as an independent subcontractor, in in certain local cities and counties, for example, MTA, if the subcontractor is getting more than hundred thousand dollars from a prime then the subcontractor also has to be certified in the sense is accounting books, is, is he charging the right amount or is he overcharging the government, things like that. So they go through that, that kind of rigmarole. So in all of your cases, the path to doing becoming a prime contractor uh, has been through being a sub? Uh, in my case, being a sub, um, for example, even before I started uh, being a sub, I worked for a lot of small cities. I would be driving, I'm a traffic engineer, started as a traffic, I would be seeing, for example, before I-5 widened, used to be always a uh, backup at uh, Beach Boulevard. I was so s sick and tired, I, I just took the exit, went to city of uh, Boina Park and said, you have a problem. Let me help you, I'll get you the funding and I'll write the application free and once, they, once you get the project, may, make me the project manager. So, you know, that's the one way you can <laughs> trust. I mean, I'm, I'm a colored person. This is a old white boys network. What do you do? There's no risk for him because it's free. So he said yes, and eventually he was a very nice gentleman. And uh, he gave me $150,000 contract. And so that's how I started as a local uh, state and local agencies. I did that for five Five cities, Mission Viejo, Anaheim, uh, uh, like that, anyway. But for that one, uh, you don't, you, I s did start as a prime on those things. But you pay, I paid the price by writing free funding application. Do a lot of free work. I, I chose subcontracting particularly because of the industry that I'm in. And so because of the performance contracts 
that are you know really a little too expensive for smaller companies to finance it's easier to get in with the prime and there's lots of work in that particular space but again it also helps to develop your past performance because even if you're a subcontractor you're still working on a federal contract so when you you know if you're going as a small business or any of those particular particular designations then you have that subcontract and past performance that can help you win the contract. Right. Um, let me drill down to this process just to give you an idea. The contracting process with the federal government is very objective. It's not subjective. You know, you don't pick the favorite guy around. It's how you respond in what's called the source selection process. The source selection process is very classified. It has, it's, um, the requirements for it are known right up front. For example, it'll say your project manager needs to have 15 years of experience in building a courthouse, for example. If you have 14 years, you basically got kicked out. If you put someone with 14 years of experience, you basically got a zero on that score when you apply for the job. How do you build up that experience? You can only get it by being a sub. It takes time to get all the references, all the information together, and that comes by teaming up with someone. It, as I said, you could be the best architect in the world, contract in the world, but unless you have a history in this process, it gets very hard to fill in the blanks in a contracting process. It can be challenged at any time. That's one thing you've got to understand. When, someone, when you win a contract, someone else has lost. And if they believe that it was given, you awarded the contract on a subjective basis, not on an objective basis, they can basically challenge the contract. And no government agency wants to be challenged. They, you know, it stops the project. So for that reason, they follow the rules very strictly. Yeah, it's protest, yeah. Yeah, protests. Yes. So um, I have kind of mixed message on networking. Um, as I understand from you, uh, the role of networking with the federal agencies is pretty limited because they don't want to be seen as whining and dining with the contractors, right? That, that's not networking. True. Okay, go ahead. Relationship building, you, you go out on lunch, you have coffee with them, right? You build a relationship, right? In private sector, it works very well. So what has been the role of networking uh, in your career? Uh, um, as I said, when I was a subcontractor, I built my relationships. Because you are there on the project, they're not responding directly to you, but they're observing how you work with them. As Vedu mentioned, you end up doing a lot of free work. I wrote a lot of RFPs for them. I gave them ideas. So they get a level of confidence in you. It's, it's an underhanded way of doing that network. You're not sitting down and breaking bread with them, because if you actually go out whining and dining with them, they have to pay for their meals. It's a very strict process. You cannot pay for that. So you can't call it truly networking. So if you're quite happy when you go out and you actually sit down with them, but they will pay for it. So don't call it a networking session. You can call it a partnering session. That's, what, that's the actual yeah. term that's used. So when I say networking, for example, um, let's say you're in computer software industry, right? Uh, so there is, a, you are interested in Department of Homeland Security or U.S. Department of State or Department of Agriculture. And if you go to OSBD, Office of Small Business and Disadvantage a, uh, Agency, you'll have, you'll see a calendar. And that calendar says for the month of May, these are the agencies that are having network or vendor outreach, they call it vendor outreach session. So you go talk to the contract managers, right? Uh, and then tell them, this is, these are my, and at that point, there are also other agencies who will be involved. Uh, for example, if there is a Department of State, there is in International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, overseas uh, embassies uh, uh, sections, or um, uh, whatever, the protocol, there are several agencies. And uh, they will all be there, and then you can go introduce yourself, hand over your business card. Now, it takes nearly three to four contacts before you can, they start trusting you, right? You can, I mean, they start believing whatever you say, but they won't say it up front. I don't know, you're just a, like any other person. So slowly you have to build that relation. That's networking. You went to the month of May, go in the month of June also if it is local, uh, or there will be a once a year mega networking session in Washington, D.C. Go network, spend two days, 
and two follow through all you need is one agency you don't so you 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 take a chance on six or seven agencies hopefully one will lead like that the funnel i was showing you uh, that's what it is you you have to make 20 or 30 agencies to yield one agency in, in some proposal or some winning so my experience has been uh, so i had a uh, i had to take this uh, the, this project was in mexico so i took all these mexicans are just like india right they expect you to do all those things uh, in fact mexico have you heard of transparency international how many of you a transparency international anyway transparency international is a non profit german organization that ranks countries by the corruption index so uh, india is i think it's 75 similar to china and mexico is mexico is 100 i think 85 india moved up from 100 to 85 because of the it industry so i i i paid for their lunches and i didn't realize one of our uh, project uh, he was a program manager i had not met him he was a uh, yes from the us embassy and uh, when i paid for everyone uh, he tapped me on the, he came out and tapped me on the shoulder and said here is the 20 dollar that you paid if you pay me once again for my lunch i will blacklist you and you won't get one project from the state department i mean it's amazing think about that right think about for example if you go to saudi arabia the way the saudi arabians do for example you take a gold bullion to one of the ministry of the interiors and you hand over like this and if he accepts immediately the, you know you are in business but then he diverts you to go and talk to his brother or his or his cousin right so conflict of interest is is the completely avoided in united states but that's the way to do business in other countries sometimes so it's completely different you can go to jail for bribing someone in other countries it's called foreign culpable practice or something like that so you have to be very careful exact be professional you don't have to buy them coffee in fact they they bought me coffee thank you for your great work we look good in front of our bosses so here is our coffee for you that's it that that is not uh, stop that doesn't stop the federal government there are no rules that the client has to i mean they can they can buy us coffee that's not a problem so what i wanted to say about that is government employees are held to the same standards as politicians they fill out conflict of interest forms for every single thing everything they receive over 25 dollars. they it's a reportable uh, item so my litmus test is always i don't want to end up on the front page that's that's not going to do me any business that's going to put me out of business yeah. Yeah. and so networking in the sense that i'm talking about is really more introducing yourself introducing your company following up asking information but getting to know someone building a relationship and you can build that relationship without putting anyone especially yourself in any jeopardy of violating any ethics laws If you have any bonding capacity required for work or any federal contracts? If I was doing construction, construction, yes. In fact, it's a very strict uh, rule. Before you lay the first break, the bonding capacity is verified, and it's a very high standard. It has to be an A plus agency that rates a bond. It's very important. And as I said, from one of my slides said, you cannot sue the federal government, but they can sue you. Yeah, they have thousands of yeah, lawyers. They have lots of lawyers. I mean, they can come after you on so many grounds. So when you give a warranty, for example, make sure you're willing to stand behind it. It's not a paper. Mm -hmm. They will hold it up. Yeah. It comes back to haunt the number of people we've worked with before. Yes. Go back in time and share with us how you got your first contract, either as a subcontractor or as a prime. Absolutely. Same question with everybody. I think we got a little bit just from Vanu, but just to get a sense of what it took to do that, right? What 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 happened behind the scenes? Sure. The struggles you have to go through. Absolutely. Um, I started my company in 1994. I told you I went thinking I was so qualified in '95 and didn't make any headway. You went to DC or something? No. In Chicago, there's a main uh, small business administration has an office. The GSA has a division of five headquarters. I went out there and uh, I thought I was fully qualified. In fact, they had published some of the FBO. I took some of the notices. I applied for it. I didn't even get a sniff back. Nothing. 1998, there was a large courthouse that was being built in Hammond, Indiana. Okay, and 
the prime contractor for that was Turner Construction. They are a Big. nationwide well-known company. Now, I had reached out to Turner on one of their, they had a small business reach out program where they were trying to build con uh, contacts with smaller companies. At which time I had presented to them saying these are the services that we are doing. Nothing to do with federal contract. I just said these are what, these are what projects we work on. They called us in and said, can you help us on the financial side and cost estimating this project? They had, I mean, I just had history, but I never worked with them. And once I did that, the GSA project manager noticed us and said, oh, I didn't know that you could do this. Call me. Three years later, 2001, is when I got that call. When they said, oh, we're going after another project. Can you help build a proposal for it? Again, as Wayne mentioned, it was not the million dollar contract. It was a fee of $8,000, but it gets you in the door. Yeah. Okay, 2004, they came back to us and said, we really love what you did. Can you come back and look at this bigger project? It was a $9 million project. So when I managed that project, then the next thing they said, we need you to be on schedule, we need you to be an IDIQ. You see how in six years I went from nothing to being on their shortlist for, pro for a project manager. And then it's never, been, it's never stopped. As I said, if you keep your professional end up after that, I won't call it a gravy train, but it definitely pays back in a regular process. Uh, sorry, to just continue on what you had said. Did, did you, had you done court projects before that? No, I hadn't done, um, not federal uh, courthouses. Okay. I hadn't done any work on that, but I had done large civic projects. Okay. I had done, I mean, projects which were 25 to 50 million. At O'Hare, we were managing a project that was 250 million. So we had some history in projects, which basically said, we feel comfortable working with So you didn't specify our first contract is in the private sector with a regulated utility and that was Southern California Edison. And we were uh, given a prime contract primarily to provide uh, design support services in the distribution, transmission distribution business unit. And again, we were bringing back retirees from Southern California Edison to work on specific projects. And so that sort of led from one project to the next project to the next project. So most of our projects have been prime. Oh, just ask. <laughs> it's just like, oh, what happens if I start a company? Uh, what kind of support do you need in this department? And it's like, well, I need to get my people back. But it was timing. You know, sometimes things are just about timing. And they had this, it was not a small early retirement program. It was a large early retirement program. And as a result of that, they had institutional brain drain. And they really needed to get those seasoned people back. Uh, in the company, they can only bring them back through a third party, through a corporation uh, or business of some sort, because if they come back or hired them back as consultants, they would have put their retirements in jeopardy. And so that's how we started. We just simply ask, and we built it from there. Thank you. I had a question more specifically for uh, Raymond. You had shared uh, uh, a breakup of uh, department their, uh, is there that, that data available? You know, what kind of IT strengths they have? What kind of, uh, uh, yeah. where is that available? If you go to Washington Weekly or Washington Top uh, 100 IT companies, because you want to start as a sub, right? Well, yeah, I mean, if, if, if not, you just go and uh, it will be there. Basically, my question is like you had like Department of Agriculture was 50 or yeah, something. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's actually it's I got it from Google actually. Oh. So you whatever question ask Google, it will come up with. Within <laughs> 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 that department, uh, do they have like a breakup of this? This how they spend per second? Yeah, they have what's called a forecast. So you can go to forecast and see how what are their project for the entire next year. First quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, like that. And then that gives you an idea. But none of this will, see when you are trying to bid on a project, when it's already out, you are a little bit late. You want to influence how it comes out. Right, you want to have your 
some if it is possible not every government agency encourages that they say i don't want to deal with it if it, especially if it's a large contract they will not entertain anyone and they have their own department uh, for example some small department of the interior or let's say um, indian affairs say, division they may not have engineers on their side to come up with a proposal a technical proposal that's where maybe you can put in some in, uh, input and they will come out and when it comes out you know you are the one who best qualified and you propose on it and hopefully you'll get the highest marks and you you get the project yeah okay i just want to add one thing that might be of value to you and that is the MBDA, uh, you heard it mentioned early, the Minority Business Development Agency under the Department of Commerce. We're MBDA client. And again, it's another form of assistance to businesses that are trying to get uh, government contracts. So I, I would recommend, highly recommend that you look for your local MBDA agencies and see and go in and talk to them and see if you're ready to do federal contracts. Uh, that's a good effort. And then the other one was, is the SBA offices. Um, even going on the SBA website, you're, you will be enlightened as to what it takes to get started getting certifications, you know, what the NACE codes are. Size standards, revenue sizes are different for the NACE codes in order to qualify for certain uh, classifications. So those are the things that you should familiarize yourself with if you're going to do federal contracts. Boy, their hands all flew up. <laughs> um, last thing to fill up, uh, fill you up in, um, the U.S. federal budget amazingly has a lot of lines and yeah, data I wanted on to how say they that. spend money. They're called prospectus projects. The Plus, large projects are called prospectus. Yeah. And it's a bit late. By the time you see it out there, they probably already have an eye as to who it's going to. But you can track it that way and then go to Prime and say, hey, I have this service I can offer. I just have a couple of comments. Sitting on the other side, I have done some RFP reviews when I was in the office. And uh, it is true, it's very objective. And if it doesn't fit the bill right, sometimes it gets overturned, up above, and then you have run it again. Yeah, recompete, yeah. Yes, and uh, so we have a team of people in our, in our group who review all that stuff, that's one. Second thing I agree with you, in creating the RFP itself, sometimes we can volunteer to inject items into the process, which can be of benefit to you, and it will be a fact in the consumer. Third thing I want to say is that <laughs> they came up with the rule saying that you cannot, uh, if you have to, if you pay for meat more than 20 bucks, you have to give a report. <laughs> well, all the lunches in Washington DC was under 20 bucks, everything included. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, for being such a good audience, uh, federal contract hungry audience. Uh, thank you uh, to the speakers for giving such valuable um, advice and sharing your experiences. And I'm sure that you will be available as prime contractors eventually one day to take one of these guys as, the, the, as your subcontractors. You have all the contact information. If you don't, it's all online at socal.tie.org. And again, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Ramesh for coming down from Chicago. Pat, you've been lovely. And Dale, thank you so much for our very hard for uh, coming down today and sharing.